I would now like to introduce to you um, our double act to finish off this morning's session, um, Dr Alison Culkin and Eileen O'Neill, who are going to talk to us about the past, present and future of prescribing for dietitians, which is obviously something high up in all of our agendas as um, we are now becoming prescribing dietitians. Were you number one, Alison? Number one. Oh. One? Closely, hopefully, followed by lots more, but I'll let Alison explain all that to you. Nice. Okay, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Caroline, for asking me and Eileen to come and talk to you today about a very exciting change, very exciting change in dietetic practice about supplementary prescribing. Um, so what is supplementary prescribing? Well, it's a voluntary partnership between an independent prescriber, so for you guys, that's probably a doctor, unless any of you are working with dentists. Probably not. So it's probably going to be a doctor. And that might be a gastroenterologist, or it might be a renal physician, or um, you know, uh, maybe a diabetologist, for example. And a supplementary prescriber um, to implement an agreed patient-specific clinical management plan with the patient's agreement. Um, the independent prescriber is responsible for the diagnosis and setting the parameters of the supplementary prescribing. So that is the difference. Supplementary prescribers are not responsible for making the diagnosis. An independent prescriber would be responsible for that. And the clinical management plan needs to be set up before the prescribing can actually start. And of course, as always with everything, patient safety comes first. Just need to clarify this point. It's not about oral nutritional supplements or enteral feeds. Okay, it's about medicines. So I thought I'd give you a little bit of a background on how we managed to get prescribing rights for dietitians, and it was quite, quite a big mountain that we had to climb. So in 2014, um, Nadja Qureshi at the BDA um, sent out an email to members of the specialist groups asking for help. And what she wanted was some case studies that demonstrated where prescribing for dietitians would really benefit patient care. Um, and she wanted a parental nutrition case study, so I, I provided that. <coughs> And then the following, um, um, in April 2014, we met for the first time a group of dietitians. So this is Ruth Chinook, who is a cystic fibrosis dietitian working in Nottingham, Candice Ward, who was a diabetes dietitian working in Cambridge, and Jan Flint, who was a renal dietitian working in London. And we had to develop something called a case of need, which we could then present to support supplementary prescribing for dietitians. And in May, we presented this proposal to NHS England. And then from September to, um, and that was, obviously, that was accepted by NHS England, and then September to December 2014, we had to prepare for the public consultation. So any change in the law, in the Health Act, has to go through a public consultation. And in February, that consultation went live, and many of you may be um, aware of it going live and were asked to comment and support the proposal. And there was a series of public engagement activities to try and um, find out what, what, what the public thought of this um, proposal. And I actually went to the one in London, which was fascinating. There's lots of different charities there supporting patient groups, um, trying to decide whether or not they would support this proposal. And I was delighted to say that in June, uh, they got 460 responses, and there was overwhelming support. There were only seven um, people that rejected the proposal. And that was mainly based on, I think, a lack of understanding of dietetic skills. It was pharmacists who were concerned that we didn't have the pharmacology understanding. Um, but on the whole, it was very, very... And Bapen, actually, uh, Mike Stroud, who was chair of Bapen at the time, sent a, a hugely supportive letter, as did the chairs of um, like the, BD, uh, the diabetes groups and cystic fibrosis groups and, and, and the, renal, the renal groups. So we had a lot of support. So then in June, we had to prepare for the consultation at the Commissions on Human Medicines because this, these were the people who were going to make the final decisions. And we presented to, the, to them. It was quite intimidating. It was a huge, big boardroom. Um, and we had to try and con convince them that dietitians had the skills and knowledge to be able to do supplementary prescribing. Um, and that was a lot of work um, by these three women. Suzanne Rastrick, Chief AHP Officer at NHS England. Sheila Morris, Deputy Chief AHP Officer and Helen Marriott, AHP Medicines Project Lead. And a couple of months later, we got approval, which was fantastic. Um, and in February um, in 2016, the ministers actually approved it, which I was delighted with, but actually they saw the benefit of dietitians being able to prescribe, and they did um, approve. 
So what can supplementary um, prescribers prescribe? Well, we can prescribe lots of different medicines. We can prescribe prescription-only medicines, pharmacy medicines. They're the ones that are behind the counter at the pharmacist that aren't readily available. Off-license and off-label medicines and licensed medicines. And that was quite important from my perspective because we prescribe things, um, for, for example, loperamide. We prescribe that in doses in much higher um, than the manufacturers recommend for patients with short bowels. So that would be allowed with supplementary prescribing. And we can control, um, prescribe controlled drugs. So for me, that would be something like codeine phosphate, which is also used as, um, as part of the short bowel protocol. So um, again, the scope of, of prescribing is quite wide, but it has to be within your area of clinical competence. And where are the roles for prescribing? Well, I've sort of alluded to this already. So, for, for example, um, renal dietitians, they would be prescribing phosphate binders or vitamin D or intradialytic parental nutrition. The diabetes dietitians would probably be prescribing oral hy um, hypoglycemic agents and insulin. And the pancreatic uh, dietitians might be uh, prescribing um, creon and fat-soluble vitamins, amongst other things. And then the nutrition support dietitians. So the obvious things are things like parental nutrition, IV fluids, and electrolytes. And again, pediatric dietitians may maybe covering all of these sort of areas. So it's really where the diet and the medicines interact. You've probably all gone to a doctor, you've done the assessment, you've calculated the requirements, you've gone to a doctor and said, can you sign this prescription for parental nutrition? Again, the same with the diabetes dietitians. They said, can we increase the insulin by this amount? The renal dietitians, I know they are constantly changing um, doses of phosphate binders. So it's about where medicine and diet come together is where I think supplementary prescribing is going to come into its own. There were a, p a few pre-course hoops that we had to jump through. Um, you can find a course, I've, I've put that link up there. There are many, many more courses now that are open um, to, to supplementary prescribing for dietitians, and Eileen's going to talk a little bit about that. Funding, it's not cheap. Um, my course costs three and a half thousand pounds, so you have to get, but there is money available from NHS England to support prescribing. You need to get trust approval. You need to show that there is a need for this within your clinical area. Um, I had to create a clinical management plan even before I was allowed on the course so that they understood what it was I was trying to prescribe. And I also had to create a flow chart for parental nutrition because parental nutrition can be quite complex. Um, but, 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 but I managed to, to, to create that. So pharmacy were happy of how this was going to work in practice. Okay. It's no relation, by the way. So I must admit, the course was quite daunting. When I got the pre-course work through, it was quite a lot of reading, quite a lot of stuff. But actually, of course, the person you would want the person prescribing for your relatives to be competent and understand what they are doing. So I'm going to hand over to Eileen, who's going to talk through the course that she attended. Thanks, Alison. Um, it's handy we're the same height, so that's good. Uh, <laughs> yes, my name's Eileen. Um, I work in Sunderland Royal, um, a hospital in the northeast of England. Um, and I'm just going to tell you a little bit about the course that I've attended, um, just so you've got some information um, if it's something that you're thinking about doing. Um, I think all the courses will be different, and I know um, Alison's been on a non medical prescribing course, whereas my course was. Um, set up specifically for dietitians. Um, so one of the local universities worked with um, one of the managers at our local trust to develop the course and make it more relevant for dietitians. So it's a little bit different to what Alison's done. Um, and it's probably going to be slightly different to what's available in the rest of the country as well. Um, so we had about 15 dietitians on the course um, from a wide range of clinical areas like Alison's already explained. So there's a few with a critical care background, um, renal dietitians, um, diabetes dietitians, quite a lot of them, um, some gastro dietitians as well, um, paediatrics and bariatrics. Um, and I think Alison's already explained the main um, sort of medications that we were all hoping to um, prescribe. So um, the application process for the course that I attended, um, they wanted um, applicants to have completed some level six study within the last three years. So that's just anything at degree level. Um, but I think a lot of the universities also run um, CPD courses that you can do beforehand if you haven't done anything um, at level six within the last three years. Um, a valid DBS, so again, just applying through the trust to get your DBS updated if that's not been done recently. Um, and a successful completion of a numeracy entrance test. 
Um, and I think for most dietitians, if you do calculations of part of your day-to-day -day job, um, that is reasonably straightforward. And there's lots of um, examples online. If you Google nurse prescribing calculations, there's lots of examples of the sorts of things that you would um, be asked in that um, entrance exam. Um, trust support. So we were very lucky that the local university had done a lot of work um, with the trusts in our area before um, the course started um, and the trusts were very supportive of that and each trust um, should have a prescribing lead um, so if you've got any queries about how to get started um, that might be a good sort of port of call is find out who the prescribing lead in your trust is um, so they need to support you you need your manager we had a service um, to agree for you to go on the course and you need to find um, a medical supervisor as well so um, mine was one of our ICU consultants um, it has to be somebody that you work with closely, that knows you well, that's happy to support your training um, because they do have quite a bit to do with you. Um, and the other thing was um, working within your specialist area for at least three years. Um, so they want you to know that area if you're going to prescribe in that area. Um, so the actual course itself, so we ran from um, February to June or July. Um, Throughout that time, we had 12 um, taught days at the university, so between two or three days a month. Um, so obviously your manager has to agree to that as well. Um, and you are legally supposed to have 40 practice hours um, throughout your, your sort of day-to-day -day job, um, which sounds like quite a lot, but it's actually very easy to fit in because I think a lot of your day-to-day -day job, you can learn prescribe and practice um, anyway. Um, so, you know, reflecting on... A critical care ward round, for example, gave lots of opportunities um, for prescribing practice. But yeah, that's something else that needs to be fitted in um, around your your job. But as you can see, um, for the the course that I did, um, the total learning hours was about three hundred hours, um, and most of that is in your own time. So what do we cover? So a wide range of topics to cover, um, considering we only had um, 12 hot days at the university. So they started off with um, a good introduction to prescribing, um, the differences between supplementary prescribing and independent prescribing for non-medical pres prescribers. Um, because I think, I know in my trust, supplementary prescribing is not used frequently at all. Um, so the knowledge around supplementary prescribing and what it is, um, is quite poor. Um, so we did a lot of um, work around that. Um, quite a lot of, around the safety about prescribing, um, the prescribing legislation that you're governed by if you are a prescriber, uh, med medicines regulatory frameworks, the governing bodies that um, provide guidelines and things as a prescriber. Um, how to write a clini clinical management plan. So different to Alison, we didn't need to have a clinical management plan prior to getting on the course. Um, but there are legal um, components to that plan that you need to know um, what they are if you're, if you're going to write a clinical management plan for somebody that you're prescribing for. Um, prescription writing as well. So we did have um, community dietitians on the course, so they need to know how to write an FP10 prescription, but we all needed to do that as part of the course um, legally to pass. Um, we did a lot about history taking, um, consent and capacity, concordance, um, ensuring that you use a structured approach um, to get a, um, a history from your patient to make sure your prescribing's safe um, and effective. Um, we did also have quite a few pharmacology lectures, um, but again, I think a lot of that was, was done in our own time. <coughs> so that's just to give you a general idea of what we covered. Um, and then the assessment we had, again, I think this is slightly different to what Alison did, but... Um, there were three components to the assessment. Um, so I think it was quite a lot to fit in um, in the time that we had because we weren't, um, we weren't doing this that long. Um, so the case report was 6,000 words and that was describing the pre prescribing process, looking at the evidence and using that <coughs> to justify your assessment of a particular patient that would be typical to you um, and justify your decision making with that as well. So then with that, um, you submitted your clinical management plan and, a, and an FP10 prescription to show that you could meet the legal requirements for that. Um, the practice portfolio we did, so that was um, 
signed off by your medical supervisor um, and your head of department or your manager. Um, so that was, the university did look at it, but they didn't um, mark it the way they marked the other things. Um, and we just had to evidence um, that we'd met all of the prescribing proficiencies. Um, so that was quite a large piece of work, but a lot of that was done um, sort of throughout that 40 hours at work and then at, um, at home. And then the exams, so there was two parts to our exam. We did a numeracy section, which you had to achieve 100% in. Um, and then we did a pharmacology section as well, which did a high, quite a high um, pass rate as well. Um, so that's just to give you a, a sort of idea, an example of a course that, um, that we did. Um, so I do hope that was helpful. If you've got any questions at all, please do just catch me. Um, I'm here all day or the emails on the PENG website as well. Um, so Alison's going to just talk you through um, an example of a case um, and then the summary as well. Okay, so I thought, um, I thought I would sort of describe how this is one of the first patients that I actually prescribed for and what, what I prescribed and how we went about it. So this is a sort of typical, I work on an interstinal failure unit, so it's mainly parental nutrition that we prescribe at St Mark's. So this is a 66-year-old female who lives with her husband with a past medical history of depression and chronic headaches. And unfortunately, in May 2017, she experienced a road traffic collision um, and had a laparotomy for a small bowel and mid-ileal injury um, and had a small bowel resection and sigmoid clostomy. This was basically a seatbelt injury because um, the car had slammed into the back of her, so it was a seatbelt injury. And she was due to go home, but then um, I think that she went home for one day and was readmitted um, soon afterwards with an acute abdomen, query bleed, query ischemia. And she had another emergency laparotomy with a small bowel resection, the formation of a jejunostomy, and an ileal mucous fistula. And she went to um, ITU for several weeks. And while she was on ICU, she had an acute kidney injury and was on hemodialysis. Um, she was then stepped down onto a gastro ward, um, but she had a persistently high output stoma with over four litres a day and was started on parental nutrition via a peripherally inserted central catheter. And the following month, she was transferred to St. Mark's for a surgical review, because hopefully we can plumb her back together and reduce her requirements for parental nutrition and um, to assess her for home parental nutrition. And during, um, unfortunately, she experienced a... Uh, central venous catheter infections, of which we so we had to remove the pick. And during this time, she was maintained on IV fluids and electrolytes until a new catheter could be inserted. So here's her anthropometry. Shows she was 82 kilos, um, tw a BMI 29.4. So she was slightly overweight. But interestingly, she'd lost a huge amount of weight um, by going to a slimming a slimming club. So she'd actually so there was a part of her weight loss that was intentional and a, uh, also a part that was, was unintentional as well. Um, she had very little fat. She'd managed to maintain a reasonably good uh, muscle mass, which was very impressive um, considering what she'd been through, but the functional capacity of her muscle was very poor. And we, we did a full micronutrient screen on admission. And you can see here she's got a slightly raised CRP and low albumin, probably due to that um, catheter-related bloodstream infection. So clinically, her OBS were stable and she was mobilising around a side room. Her outputs were between 1.6 to 2.3 litres a day. She was on a 500 ml oral fluid restriction and was eating a low-fibre diet of about 500 calories and 25 grams of protein. So as part of the, of the, you know, the dietetic assessment, we would um, estimate, do a full nutritional assessment and estimate the patient's requirements. I'm not going to go into how, how I estimated the requirements, but it was just to point out really that um, during the period of time when she was off parental nutrition, the doctors were prescribing her, her IV fluids, and unfortunately she developed some quite significant edema um, during that period of time. So as is often the case when um, you are prescribing, you need to take into account other people's prescribing errors, maybe? Is that a nice way of putting it? Um, because sometimes it's quite difficult and complex to estimate fluid and electrolyte requirements. So actually, we ended up giving her a low-sodium, low-volume parental nutrition to try and help alleviate that edema that she was experiencing. And the thing that I've really taken away from the prescribing course is every time I look at a drug chart now, I get the BNF out because it never ceases to amaze me how many relevant side effects patients are experiencing. So I didn't know that daltaparin could cause hyperkalemia. Did anyone else know that? 
I didn't know that either. Um, on Dancitron, hypertension, diarrhea. She's on the St. Mark's solution. I've, I've said a potential side effect is palatability because um, it doesn't taste very nice. Um, things like loperamide, dry mouth, dizziness, nausea, vomiting, pa you know, things that patients experience all the time. And often, if they say they've got a dry mouth, you may think, well, they're dehydrated, but actually it could be a side effect of their medication. Codeine, similar. Um, omeprazole, again, diarrhea, vomiting, dizziness, you know, quite significant. Hypernatremia and hypermagnesemia. I think we, we all know um, some of these side effects, but not all of them. Um, and paracetamol. One of the main um, side effects of that is malaise, you know. So quite significant side effects that then could affect your parental nutrition prescription. So what did we do with this lady? We inserted a new central venous catheter um, and we did some gastrointestinal mapping so that we could plan her future surgery. And this was her micronutrient management. So again, I prescribed the parental nutrition, but when her micronutrients started coming through, surprise, surprise, she had a low vitamin D, as ma majority of our patients do. So I prescribed 300,000 um, international units IM and then followed that up with some oral medicine. Her selenium was also low, so I prescribed 500 micrograms IV for three days. That is part of our normal practice. And her vitamin A was also low, so I prescribed 100,000 um, international units. And then, of course, she was getting a full micronutrient um, solution as part of her parental nutrition. So she did quite well. So her weight um, on the low sodium, low fluid parental nutrition slowly, slowly reduced um, back to sort of her baseline. So in conclusion, this is a patient with short bowel requiring home parental nutrition. She was overweight and overloaded when, when, when I did the assessment. So it's about providing appropriate parental nutrition. Um, micronutrient prescriptions, so that was vitamin A, D, and selenium deficiencies were corrected. Um, from a quality of life perspective, we always try and feed patients during the night so that they're free from the feed during the day. And then, of course... Uh, my main aim was actually to maintain her nutritional status. Even though she had a BMI of 29, I think she's, she, we're planning for future surgery. So actually, because she'd lost so much weight, my aim was to maintain her nutritional status. I was going to just talk a little bit about some of the challenges. As, as Eileen has said, it's a master's level course. It's quite intense. Um, but you learn huge amounts um, about things like drug errors and how drug errors can debilitate patients. Um, the interactions terrified me. Because our patients are on loads of medications, and they're often all interacting with each other, sometimes cancelling each other out. So having a good understanding of that is really important. Polypharmacy. Some of our patients have got three drug charts. You know, so you have to wonder, what is going on? Um, I'll never look at a, a drug chart in the same way again. As I mentioned already, the poor prescribing of others again so that's quite um, a challenge and maybe trying to discuss that with the prescriber uh, and I've also been a little bit wary of prescribing again I had a patient recently where he was feeling sick and I am allowed to prescribe on Dancitron as part of my clinical management plan so I got the BNF out again and there's, it's a contraindication in intestinal obstruction and I felt that he had an element of intestinal obstruction but when I talked to the doctors about it they just laughed at me and they went oh no we do this all the time it's fine so I think we probably will be safe prescribers we will be quite wary um, because I think we have that understanding that we need to um, investigate medications and have a bit more of a, an, a, um, a cautious approach to prescribing. So what are the benefits of supplementary prescribing? Well, the benefit to the patient and other healthcare professionals, there's a faster access to medicine. So when I got that vitamin D result, I prescribed the vitamin D, I went straight to the nurse, and I said, can you give this vitamin D? The same with the other micronutrients. So patients will get their medicines faster. Patients' attitude, they're very happy. They're like, oh, finally, you can sign your own prescriptions. That's so nice. Saving pharmacists and doctors' time as well. Our poor pharmacists are often running around trying to find a doctor to sign that parental nutrition prescription. So they're quite happy. And the doctor is no longer responsible for your assessment. This is your assessment. You've put all the hard work in. You know the patient. They are then not taking responsibility. From the dietitian perspective, I think you get a bit more respect from other healthcare professionals. The legal responsibility for the decision making is important. Massively improved pharmacology knowledge. I think Eileen, you probably agree with me from that perspective. And a real, a really, a better understanding of the BNF. That book is amazing. It's amazing, the BNF. And I've got a little app now, my little BNF app. So it's it's a really good um, app, and I have a better understanding of how medications work. So this is my take-home message. Go, go for it. It's really, really good. <laughs> um, 
I'm going to talk a little, I've got one slide about the future. So what we need now, what, it's never ending, is it? What we, we need now is evidence of good supplementary prescribing practice. Um, we, can, we need to prove that we are saving doctors and pharmacists' times. We need to show that it is benefiting patient care. Um, myself and Nadia at the BDA are trying to set up a supplementary prescribing group for dietitians so that we can learn from each other and um, maybe try and come up with some standardised tools to um, encourage best practice. Because what we really, really, really want is independent prescribing. We want to not have to put a clinical management plan together for a patient. We want to be able to just prescribe um, on our own, but we need evidence to support that. But that's the next step. I just want to acknowledge um, Nadia Qureshi at the BDA, without whom none of this would have happened. She was the real powerhouse pushing forward them supplementary prescribing from the BDA. And the dietitians that I've also mentioned already who were involved in the very, very early stages of putting the case of need together, because without that, um, we, we wouldn't have had prescribing. Thank you very much. Has anyone got any questions? Oh, I think the microphone's here down at the front. Thank you. I just had a, a question just around the clinical management plan and how it works in terms of do you need it, one for each individual patient or is there one just for you to be able to describe for everyone you see? What way does it work, please? So you need one for every patient because it's very patient specific. Um, it, there are standard templates that you have, to, you have to complete and they will include the medications that your patient is on and their past medical history and their past surgical history, any allergies that they have. But the way that I have done my clinical management plan is I've written every single drug that I am allowed to prescribe on that clinical management plan because otherwise that's going to be very time consuming to be able because you'll be adding things on and taking things away all the time I know so this is why I think we need a group a working party to know what other dietitians are doing to see if we can try and standardize um, the, the, the tools as much as possible I know there's another dietitian called Beth who works in Exeter who's sort of done the same as well so she's she's created everything that she is allowed to prescribe on that that clinical management plan I don't know whether you have you done the same or um, yeah I think the clinical management plan is definitely one of the issues because it will be time consuming um, the legal requirements around it, you need to have, I think, in a critical care setting it might be an issue because the consultants change every week and you, your consultant needs to have agreed that with you and the patient. Um, so that's been raised as a bit of an issue as well. Um, but yeah, I think I'll probably end up having, I haven't started using it yet, but having a clinical management plan that's then tweaked for certain patients. But a copy will need to go in their notes as well. Any other questions? One in the middle and then one to the side. Hi, uh, just a quick one. Is there any kind of um, future work that you have to go on and do, like any updates or kind of, you know, reviews with anyone at university or anything? Um, in terms of being a supplementary prescriber, um, I think they just encourage CPD and um, all that sort of thing, which will be difficult because there's not very many prescribing dietitians at the minute but hopefully that will improve with time um, so it's great to hear Alison's going to set up a group hopefully um, the dietitians I met on the group um, we're going to set up something um, for some clinical supervision but also with um, like your medical supervisor and things like that um, if you were to progress to independent prescribing then there would be additional work to add on so in our trust, we have a non-medical prescribing committee and that every year you have to submit evidence of your prescribing practice in order for them, because this is about your trust, because you have to get trust approval even after you've qualified to say what you're going to prescribe, how you're going to prescribe it, how you're going to keep up your CPD. Um, and so, so you have to document that. But yeah, you're right, there aren't any prescribing courses per se, but... For example, coming on a course like this, you could say, I have learned about estimating requirements or the limitations of estimating requirements, and that is part of your prescribing practice to have that understanding. You've also, I'm also going to meet my um, independent prescriber every two months to discuss my prescribing practice as well, and I think until you are established, that's probably quite a good thing to do because it's very, those discussions are very interesting and very, and very helpful. 
just one more question at the back and then one at the front. I just wanted to ask about, um, am I right that you said it wasn't regarding prescribing oral nutrition supplements and enteral tube feeds? And I just wanted to just double check on that because obviously in the community that's one of the main things we would hope to have the power to be able to prescribe. So you can prescribe as, 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 an, as a supplementary prescriber, you can prescribe those things. And I have I've put those in my clinical management plan because it would be crazy not to. But I think there is a prescribing support dietitians group as part of the BDA about... It's, are you talking about taking things like off FP10? Um, no, sorry, I just meant generally about prescribing them. I'm actually mm. in that prescribing support dietitians group and I know on a recent study day I went to one of the other group members had been on the supplementary prescribing course and was finding it really useful around supporting um, the rest of the dietitians in the area about getting the right oral nutrition um, supplement prescriptions for the community patients. So I just wasn't quite clear what yeah. the difference was here. Yeah. I suppose it's, it's quite an intense course to go through to just focus on oral nutritional supplements and enteral nutrition. Because I'm sure as a community dietitian, there could be other medication, like vitamins, minerals, trace elements, that you, or, or other medications that you might want to prescribe for your patient for their particular condition. So for example, um, you, you're, you're based in the community. Yeah. So for example, we were talking about refeeding. You might want to prescribe thiamine or potassium, or magnesium, or phosphate for your patient. Oh, um, yeah. And underneath, with, with supplementary prescribing, you would be able to do that rather than just limit yourself to the, to the oral nutritional supplements and enteral feeds. So I wasn't saying it was not about that, but I was saying this is a much broader um, category of medicines okay, that, that you can prescribe. It was just because they didn't feature at all, and I knew that this, obviously, we would also want to be able to adjust other medications that were relevant to our mm. patients, but mm. still for a lot of us that would probably be not the entire focus, but a big focus yeah. on where we would benefit from doing the course. Yeah. And I just was a bit confused, so Sorry. thank you. Sorry. <laughs> so um, just in response to that, I was involved with some of the discussions with the BDA in the first instance about the focus of this supplementary prescribing and they were very keen that it was the focus was not to be on enteral nutrition and supplements because um, in part you have to have a medical supervisor and the argument is that the medical staff will never know as much about enteral nutrition and supplements as you as a dietitian do so who do you get as your medical supervisor so your focus should be on the other things that you will prescribe and then you slot your oral nutritional supplements and feed underneath that. So it, it, that was part of the basis of why the case studies were never including supplements or feeds, because they would argue um, that, rightly so, that, we, that nobody will know as much about that as dietitians do. And then there was another piece of work that the BDA were working on at that time around separating the ACBS prescribing and, and how do we do something with that and that seems to have disappeared a little bit for, for whatever reason. Um, so that, that's just to give you a little bit of background as well, it's not that they were excluded, it was just that, as Alison says, it sh shouldn't have been about the focus. There's a comment at the back. Hi, I'm the chair of the subgroup for the prescribing support. Just to clarify about the BDA, they, it hasn't gone. They do have in they, a case for change document um, and uh, that they have put recommendations of looking at should ACBS products. And they have recommendations for about two or three examples. One of them is off of FP10. The other is looking at a dietitian's formulary. Um, and that recommendation has gone to the Department of Health, where it is at, I don't know, um, and that's up. But 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 it hasn't it hasn't gone at a standstill. So I, I think I just wanted to clarify that. 
Okay. I think the thing with a community is it's not a straightforward process. It is very different and I, for supplementary prescribing. And it's, it's the infrastructure that's not in place actually to physically get that, that uh, prescription or voucher to the, to the patient. And the, so that's the things that I think need to be looked at. One question from Anne and then we'll have to close. Um, congratulations to you both for actually breaking new ground and actually doing all the hard work and, and trailing the blaze for other dietitians to follow. That was great to hear about your experiences. Um, I just wonder, I know we've got a couple of people from the universities in the room as to whether, uh, as part of the review of the curriculum, whether there's going to be some introduction around prescribing and responsibilities, um, and obviously not, uh, not, not in the undergraduate programme, but obviously... Um, just as an induction initially, and then whether, like Eileen's uh, local university, whether we'll see more courses tailored to dietitians' needs. And secondly, I, I just struggle with one of the issues at the moment uh, around uh, nutritional support products is, is the budget pressures, and, and GPs would argue there's budget pressures for all sorts of drugs. Um, but if you're a practice nurse or a practice-based pharmacist, you're often assigned to a specific surgery or a number of surgeries. And what I struggle with, or perhaps don't understand, is if you got, if you became a, a supplementary prescriber, and you're say a community dietitian, uh, how does that how is that prescription budgeted for? Because you might be working across a whole host of practices. So how does that work in terms of budgets? Um, because if you're in a trust and you're prescribing parental nutrition, it's probably coming off some hospital trust budget. But does anybody know? So I think, I mean, I think that was... that uh, The difference between our courses was that I was surrounded by pharmacists and nurses, and there were two physios and me. And it was interesting to... I mean, you, you would have to ask, you know, them, how, what are you prescribing? How does it work? Who pays for it? Um, I think once... Once people start prescribing, once community dietitians or all dietitians start prescribing, we need to find out those things. You know, how is it benefiting patients? Is it saving money? But I think until people start prescribing, we haven't got any of the answers to those questions. At the moment, we need we need we need that data. We need people to start prescribing. Yeah, universities. We'll speak, um, I obviously work at Queen Margaret University in Edinburgh, and I, but I think the curriculum, I, I don't think, I, I know that the curriculum is devised by the BDA and we're, we're given a set curricul curriculum that we have to deliver. The, my understanding is that this, there will be no additional pharmacology, pharmacogenetics um, included over and above what is already in the curriculum at the moment because of the issues around you've got to have been working in your specialist area for three years and and what universities are doing is producing graduate dietitians on pre-registration courses whether when we become independent prescribers and it becomes um, more prolific within the profession that changes but i i still think that you will need to have been working in your specialist clinical area for three years and and so it, I don't think it will ever be a pre-registration requirement, but whether it becomes a module within wider masters for people at post-registration who are doing masters in other things, then that then that is definitely a, a possibility that it could mm -hmm. become part of that. But th there's not plans at the moment. Okay, thank you very much.